Hi everyone, my name is Chris. Joyce and I will present our paper, GPU Hammer, Ruham Attacks on GPU Memory, so practical. This work is done entirely within the University of Toronto, supervised by Professor Gurush. Here's a quick recap of the row hammer vulnerability. Computer memories are organized into banks of rows of electrocells in a DRAM chip. Rohammer, discovered back in 2014, notes that by accessing DRAM rows rapidly, neighboring rows will start to experience bit flips. This has thus become a major threat for data integrity. Rohammer exploits targeting CPU-based DRAMs are well studied on both DDR and LPDDR chips. On CPUs, common exploits try to perform privilege escalation, such as instruction modification and page load tampering, as well as targeting confidential data like keys and cryptographic protocols. But you know who else uses DRAMs? GPUs, and now they hold critical data like ML models. Their security is a major concern. So what's the threat model? GPU can be shared in time size scenarios where a victim attacker can run their code at separate time intervals while having their data co-located on the same DRAM. This makes them vulnerable to Rohammer attacks. So our goal is to show how to launch Rohammer on GPUs. First, let us review the most basic Rohammer workflow for GPUs. First, the attacker needs to access memory address on cache. Otherwise, the access doesn't go to DRAM. Then, the DRAM will try to retrieve data from the physical row the address is mapped to. In this case, 0xc is mapped to row 1. To retrieve the data of row 1, an activation for ACT command is issued to that row. The ACTs are the main culprit of the row hammer vulnerability, which disturbs the data in neighboring rows. This command opens row 1 and brings its data to the row buffer for read and write. But the row buffer is a problem, as it functions similarly as the cache, meaning subsequent accesses to row 1 goes to the buffer and does not need ACTs. Thus, in order to keep triggering ACT commands, we need a way to evict rows from this buffer. We can do this by accessing another row, forcing the buffer to evict. By repeating this process, we can trigger ACTs rapidly, leading to bit flips in neighboring victim rows. Okay, that doesn't sound very difficult at the moment, but there are several big hurdles we need to overcome. There are three main challenges in launching Rohammer attacks on GPUs. First, we work with virtual memories, meaning we don't know which row or which bank an address maps to. Second, GPUs have a, high, a very high memory latency, 4 to 5x of CPUs, making it very hard to rapidly trigger ACTs. Third, although hardware changes take a long time, modern DRAMs have came up with defenses against Rohammer such as target or refresh, and we will need to bypass such defenses in order to see bit flips. Let's look at the first challenge. We need to hammer neighboring rows in the same bank, but given a virtual address, how do we know which bank and row it belongs to? To retrieve the mapping, we leverage timing site to from prior work drama. Suppose we have two addresses, 0xA and 0xB. If they're in different banks, accessing them at the same time will have low latency as each bank has their own buffer. But if they're in the same bank, they need to take turns to use the row buffer, leading to a higher latency. This way, if we keep the address such as 0xA constant, we can find all addresses in the same bank at 0xA by observing this latency. Once you have all the addresses in the same bank, we can just observe the absence of such conflict to know whether they're in the same row. Now, let us look at the methods to measure latency. We use GPU threads to access address pair 0xA and another address 0xB. We first clear the cache of both addresses before accessing their data. Then the threads will only proceed when both accesses have completed, thus giving us only the slowest of the two latencies. We take the minimum of 10 measurements, avoiding spikes from system noise. Here's a sample visualization of the access time difference between same bank and different bank for the entire memory layout. However, we see a concerning overlap at 370 nanoseconds, where they're indistinguishable. This is due to the uh, due to the non-uniform memory access effect, where although no conflict happened, one can still have a longer latency due to its distance from the GPU. Fortunately, we have a way to filter them. Addresses in the same bank are in the same DRAM chip. This must be physically close. We can use this insight to filter addresses that are too far apart to be in the same bank, those that have high access latency even on their own. After removal of the NUMA effect, we, we can see a clear cutoff. Now we have an effective scheme to retrieve the memory layout for Rohan. The second challenge is GPU's high memory latency, which is four to five times higher than CPU's. Therefore, GPU Rohammer is subject to more strict time constraints. In DRAM, cells leak charge over time and must be periodically refreshed. 
In particular, these refresh commands are issued once every TRP or 1.9 microseconds on GDDR6. And all rows must be refreshed within a TRFW or 32 milliseconds. Hence, we need to hammer with high enough intensity to trigger bit flips before the victim rolls gets refreshed, which motivates us to issue as many activations as possible in the TRFW. With this goal in mind, let's take a closer look at a naive single thread hammering loop, which is similar to hammering on CPU DRAM. First, the thread issues a load request to an aggressor row in the memory. This triggers a row activation in DRAM, then the loaded data is transferred back to the SM during which DRAM remains idle. After that, the thread can finally send the next load and rise and repeat. Since a significant portion of the time is wasted on data transfer, single thread hammering achieves only 15% of the theoretical maximum intensity. This is clearly suboptimal, so what can we do? A natural improvement is to use multiple threads. With multiple threads, memory requests can be issued in parallel, effectively overlapping delays and improving throughput. As we see in this graph, increasing the number of threads significantly improves the hammering intensity to 80% of the theoretical max. But there's a caveat. Threads within a warp execute in lockstep, which means that even if thread 1 receives its data early, it can proceed to the next request until the low, slowest threads in the warp finishes. So can we do even better? Yes, by multi-warp hammering. A warp consists of typically 32 threads executing the same instruction together. In multi-warp hammering, we utilize one effective thread per warp and use multiple warps to issue requests. Unlike threads within a warp, warps are scheduled independently. This means one warp can send out this, a second memory request as soon as the first request completes without waiting for other warps. This further minimizes idle time on the DRAM. With multi-warp hammering, we can achieve up to 6 20k activations per refresh window using 8 or more warps. This reaches 93% of the theoretical maximum and provides enough activations to reliably trigger a bit flip. Moving on to the final challenge, it comes from the NDRAM defenses like target row refresh built by chip manufacturers. TRR mitigates row hammer by keeping track of recently accessed row in a fixed size tracker and refreshing one of them every refresh interval. To bypass TRR, prior work proposed two techniques. First, trespass shows that the tracker can be overflowed by many-sided hammering by activating more than two distinct aggressor rows. Because the tracker only holds a fixed number of entries, hammering many different rows forces one row out of the tracker and it escapes and is not refreshed. For example, here a four entry tracker will evict one entry if five aggressors are hammered. Second, Smash makes that escaped cons entry consistent by synchronizing hammering with mitigated refreshes. We deliberately create holes in the hammering pattern for refreshes to occur, maintaining the same tracker activity in each TRFE and the same entry to be evicted every interval. All of the above prior work applies only to single-threaded settings. We extend synchronization to a multi-thread setting. We insert the same delay after each warp's hammering, creating aligned gaps that allow mitigated refreshes to occur. A natural follow-up is how much delay is needed. We can identify synchronization points using another timing trick. After each round of hammering, we insert addition to introduce controlled delays. The memory may stop mid-hammering for refreshes. Naturally, as we increase the number of additions, the time it takes to hammer also increases. However, since TRR refreshes stall the memory, if additional delay overlaps with the refresh latency, then the total time plateaus instead of increasing. So, when we observe that increasing the delay no longer increases the time per round, as seen around 56 additions here, it indicates that the hammering is aligned with the DRP. The key takeaway here is, by aligning our hammering with DRAM refresh periods, we can reliably fold the tracker and bypass the NDRAM defenses. We now have solved all three challenges and we're ready to see bit flips. We ran a hammering campaign on three GPU models. 
an RTX A6000 with GDDR6 memory, an A100 with HBM2E, and an RTX 3080 also with GDDR6. We hammered four banks on each GPU with 8 to 24 aggressors and both checkered data pattern. This took us about 30 hours per bank per GPU. The table here shows the number of bit flips we found. Our attack succeeded on the A6000, on which we observed 8 bit flips across all tested banks. The other two GPUs showed no bit flips. The lack of bit flips on these two could be due to differences in memory chips, higher row hammer thresholds, or unaddressed in DRAM mitigation. After observing bit flips on the A6000, we next identified the critical aggressor rows whose presence is sufficient to trigger a bit flip. We asked, given an observed bit flip, which aggressor rows are responsible? We identified the critical aggressor rows for each flip in this table. From the table, we observed that bit flips can only be triggered by rows from one site only, and rows at R plus minus 2 are the most effective. This suggests that DRAM rows layout is not contiguous. Next, we characterize the row hammer threshold. Earlier in challenge 2, we aimed for maximum hammer intensity. But here we ask, what's the minimum number of activations to trigger bit flips on GDDR6? We found that it takes at least 12.3k activations to a single DRAM roll before we observe a bit flip. Other bit flips may require up to 16k activations. Let's wrap up with the TRR tracker size characterization. In challenge 3, we illustrated TRR with a small 4 entry tracker, but what about on the A6000? Our experiments show that bit flips only occur when the number of aggressor rows is 17 or more. This means we need at least 17 aggressors to overflow the tracker, which suggests the tracker can hold 60 rows per bank. You can also find more on bit flip characterizations in our paper. For exploit, several bit flipping attacks exist for our ML models, such as the accuracy degradation, which renders the model useless, backdoors to force model to produce harmful outputs, and jailbreaking to bypass model safeguards. We demonstrate the accuracy degradation attack with our bit flip. It was demonstrated in prior work, terminal brain damage, that a single flip in the floating point exponent can change the model weight drastically, degrading accuracy to almost none. For the exploit, we assume the time slice scenario in our flip model. An important requirement for the attack is that we need to place victim data in the vulnerable role. To do so, the attacker needs to massage the GPU memory. It will first allocate the entire memory and free holes in the vulnerable regions. This way, during the victim time size, they're forced to place model in the hole with the bit flip. Then, in the next time size, the attacker can hammer for accuracy degradation. We evaluated our exploit against five popular DNN ML models by flipping the top bit in exponent of random weights. We found that in under 10 attempts, we can degrade model accuracy from 80% to 0%. We responsibly disclosed to NVIDIA and they confirmed the issue. And we recommend enabling ECC for all of these GPUs in the security notice. However, we observe up to 10% slowdown on our GPU with ECC enabled. At its core, Rohammer is a hardware flaw, and we urge principal mitigations in future DRAMs. In summary, GPU Hammer is the first practical Rohammer attack on discrete GPUs. We introduced novel techniques to overcome challenges for GPU Rohammer, and we exploit bit flips to degrade DNN accuracy. Thanks for watching.